felt the best and just sick, cold sweat and all that other crazy stuff. Head cold and everything, trying to take a little medicine here and there and keep uh, keep fighting, keep going. Got a job I got to work on tomorrow. You know, it's a funny thing about uh, sickness. Even when you're sick, your bills still are due. Imagine that. Still got bills and still got things you got to do. So uh, turn your Bibles tonight, the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter number 10. And uh, while you're turning there tonight, I want to say we appreciate all of you again for being here in the house of the Lord. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 22 through verse 25. I've touched on this in the past and uh, talked about it a little bit. And, and uh, I was going to use this message a few weeks back to preach from. And, and uh, some of you may remember I brought a picture of me and Sister Myers when we hadn't long gotten married there. And and a marriage photo, and now here it is, 20-plus years. 20, what is it, 4, 24 years now we've been married? Something like that. Pretty close. And uh, But I just know we've been together a really long time. And a lot of commitment, a lot of days, a lot of years, a lot of months of commitment. And that's how we got where we're at tonight. If you got your Bible, Hebrews 10, verses 22, verse 25, say Amen. Amen. Robert said amen. Anybody else find it? Amen. Hallelujah. Verse 22 through verse 25. This is what the Bible said. Let us draw near with the true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. I want to read that again. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Many of you over the years, you've heard this verse quoted where it says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves. And uh, here it is, the Bible talking about us being faithful to the house of God. That's not what I'm going to preach on tonight so much anyway, but I want you to look at that again. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another as so much the more as you see the day approaching. So if there's ever been a time that you would want to be faithful, if there's ever been a time that you want to be committed, dedicated to the Lord, is as you see the days getting closer to the coming of the Lord. Now is the time. Now is not a time to slumber and sleep. Now is the time to be faithful. Can you say amen? Stretch the hand of the Lord tonight. Let's pray for the will of God. Father, we praise you and we love you tonight. For the word of God, we pray tonight, Lord, that you'll use the word to speak to us. Help us to know exactly what you would have to say to us as a church. And we'll give you the praise and the glory and the honor for everything that you do. In Jesus' name, everyone can say amen. I don't believe tonight that you or I have to look very far to find a lack of true commitment in the world that we're living in today. The other day I was at a pastor's uh, church and was doing a little work and him and I were talking about different things. And from one pastor to another, you wonder to yourself sometimes when you're pastoring a church, if other churches or other pastors are dealing with or seeing some of the same things that you're seeing yourself. We began to get on the subject of commitment. And him and I pretty much touched on basically the same high points of ministry and about the things concerning the church and the people of God. And he began to tell me how that in his church, pretty much the same things that I had experienced myself, that even though they-
experience the same thing. How that we have people that want to do ministry, claim to be called, they call, they claim to be called to preach, called to sing, talents and gifts to do things for the Lord. And they want the limelight of being on the pulpit. They want the limelight of being seen by everybody. They want to be able to have positions and titles, but they don't want responsibility and most of all the commitment that it comes with that so that you are respectable in that position. And uh, I guess I could say equally and fairly, the only ones that have experienced that as a matter of fact churches all over the united states and other countries are experiencing some of the very same things it seemed like when the bible said that in the last days there'd come a great falling away i don't know if that's exactly what we're experiencing but it sure does look that way doesn't it when you look around and you see the lack of real commitment i found something about commitment that's interesting Different people view commitment different ways. I found people that will commit to certain things as long as it's convenient for them. So in other words, for them, it's a short-term commitment. Say, I'll do something, but I'll only commit for a certain amount of time. That's not real commitment. That'd be like saying, I'll be married to you uh, six months out of the year, but the other six months, I want to do my own thing. What kind of commitment would that be? Amen. That's the way some folks view commitment when it comes to serving the Lord. And when I signed up to serve God, if you want to put it that way, I signed up to be committed in matter if it was a spiritual rain, sleet, snow, or hail. It didn't matter if it was a spiritual drought or if it was a spiritual sun, shiny, rainy day. I signed up to serve God. I was going to serve God no matter what came my way. It hadn't always been easy. Say amen. Some of you have been through the same thing, but you made up your mind you're going to serve God no matter whatever came your way. I hope that's the way that you felt. But there's a lot of folks that their commitment is a short-lived thing. It's kind of like, well, I'll be there every once in a great while. And so in their eyes, they're committed because they're there every once in a great while. They're faithful every once in a great while. They're available every once in a while. But as soon as it comes between them and what they want to do, their commitment stops right there. That's not real genuine commitment. And you know, I want you to understand tonight that commitment, the lack of commitment, is the reason why that we see so many problems within the church. You want to know the reason why that you see people that jump from church to church and they're here six months, they're a year, here two or three weeks, they're three months is because of a lack of commitment. You know the reason why that we cannot have the church programs and the things that we'd like to have in the church? I've had people ask me before that call up the church and they say, Pastor Meyer, so what do you, does your church have to offer? We're looking for a church. I'd love to be able to say, man, we got a youth department. We're exploding out the seams. We got good, faithful youth. We got good, faithful people, blah, blah, blah. But unfortunately, I can't say we've got 50 or 60 young people and a bunch of folks working with the youth because a lot of times what you see is a lack of commitment. And because of that lack of commitment, we don't have people in positions. I'd like to be able to say, man, we've got this department. I'd like to be able to say, man, we've got a seniors club. We've got a seniors program for our elderly folks, but unfortunately, because of a lack of commitment, uh, we don't have that. And so I can't offer that to somebody because we don't have that. Amen. If you look around the church, you don't have to look long and far before you understand that the reason why many of our problems are the way they are is a lack of commitment. The reason why that our singing isn't any better than what it is. A lot of times because of a lack of commitment. A lot of times it's because the saints of God are not committed enough to practice whenever they ain't in church, to practice and to get better at what they're doing, to learn new songs. Amen. The reason why our pulpits are dead and a lot of our preachers can't preach their way of a wet paper sack is because of a lack of commitment because their life is not dedicated. Amen. They don't pray. They don't ask God for the sermon and they'd rather take a message out of a newspaper or out of some article or something that just fits their fancy instead of preaching the anointed, unadulterated word of God. And so because of
of a lack of commitment, we are where we are today in many ways. Instead of seeing people praying in the altar when an altar call is given, many times it's because of a lack of commitment. You want to know the reason why? That you can't seem to get anybody willing to do anything in the church. It's because of a lack of commitment. You want to know the reason why that churches are struggling financially? You under you really want to know why that we can't hardly pay the church bills and not just at Gray Street, man, there's churches all over. Pastors that should be getting a salary, amen, but instead of them having to do that, they're having to work jobs and put their money in the church to keep the doors open. You know the reason why that is? It's a lack of commitment. Everybody wants a big church to go to. Everybody wants a church that's on fire. Everybody wants a pastor and a pastor's wife, amen, that's faithful. Everybody wants an anointed man of God. Everybody wants a pastor that's able to show up whenever they got sickness or the snotty flu or whatever. Amen. But nobody wants to be committed. And I tell you the problem is uh, that if you and I don't get committed and sell out and serve God with every bit of our heart, the church is going to continue to decline the way that we see it. Amen. We wouldn't be the only church that would close its doors because of a lack of commitment. Amen. Every day I would just about venture to say there's churches closing their doors. Amen. Because of the fact that there is a lack of commitment on the part of the people of God. Can you say God help us tonight? Do you know commitment It's what keeps you and I on the job? Anybody ever been working for a company? And you thought to yourself, I'd rather just tell the boss, you can have this job and I'll just walk right off and I'll go home. But commitment to your family, if it even ain't even commitment to, uh, to the job, commitment to your wife, commitment to your family would say you can't quit now because if you quit, you can't pay your bills. If you can't pay your bills, you and your wife ain't got a place to live and your babies ain't got a place to sleep at night so commitment keeps you on the job can you say God help us tonight commitment's what keeps you and I in the fight do you know tonight that even a boxer if he's not committed to the last bell rings he'll give up in the beginning of the fight but when you get people that are willing to fight no matter what are you listening to me tonight when you get somebody that's willing to fight until they hear the last bell ring it doesn't matter if they get hit the most. It doesn't matter if they don't win. Come on, somebody. As long as they stayed in the fight, they're able to say when it's all over with, uh, I finished the battle. I fought to the very end. Are you hearing me, somebody? Do you know tonight there's a lot to be said about somebody that'll stay in the fight all the way to the very end. Somebody that won't back down. Amen. Somebody that won't throw in the the towel just because they experience a, a little bit of trouble. Amen. I believe tonight that if we had a whole lot more people with a lot more commitment the church would be doing a whole lot more than what it's doing tonight. But if we can't get everything the way we want it to, amen, we're not going to stay in the fight. Listen, that's not the will of God. Listen, sometimes things are not going to be your way. Can you say amen? If you look at John the Baptist on the Isle of Patmos told John the Revelator on the Isle of Patmos uh, amen the Bible said he was there for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ and I tell you tonight a man that was dipped in a pot of boiling water amen a boiling oil and he's got boils all over his body he, they couldn't kill him so they put him on the Isle of Patmos uh, for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ and I tell you that wasn't convenient that wasn't the best circumstance but he stayed in the fight I wonder tonight how many of you if you'd have been put in a pot of boiling oil that you'd have still came to the house of God you'd have still prayed in the altar and you'd have still give God your everything I tell you tonight there's a lot of folks that wouldn't and you ain't got to look very far to figure that out it's what causes us to hold on when it seems like <clears throat> we got every reason to let go. Commitment is what causes you to hold on. When you look around and you feel like I've got every reason 
to let go. I've had sisters before that told me, said, I don't know what to do. My husband don't want to serve God. I try to go to church. He stays at the house. He don't want nothing to do with God. And sometimes you just got to say, sis, hold on. Even when you got every excuse to quit, even when you feel like you got every reason to throw up your hands, keep fighting. Don't you let the devil beat you out of a blessing. Don't you let the devil cheat you out of God's help. You just keep right on fighting. You know why? Because there's a commitment inside of you. Do you know that every military personnel that's ever stepped foot on a foreign soil he had to have some kind of commitment when he stepped on that soil. You can't turn your back because if you do the enemy's going to kill you. That's just the way it is. But if you got commitment you're going to see the fight through. Can you say amen? It helps whenever there's others around you that are committed because it makes you feel like man if they're committed Man, if that's the way that it's done, can you imagine being in the military and the man that you were under, you got on foreign soil and you were there with your weapon in hand and the man that was your company commander or whatever looked to you and said, retreat, turn back men now. You know that everybody's going to do exactly that and it causes you to think, man, that's an experienced man. And if that man thinks it's time to retreat, then it must really be time to retreat. Do you know if you've been in this fight for a long time that you've got family members that are watching you and if you retreat and if you quit, they're going to say, my God, if that man that served the Lord all these years is going to quit, then it must be time to quit. No, it ain't time to quit. It's time to gird up your loins of your body, your mind, your soul. Amen. With the spirit of God and run back out into the fight and give it everything you got. Can you say amen? It ain't the best most pleasant feeling in the world now, is it? I want to tell you the commitment is the backbone of a soldier. Do you know that God's army is compared to a soldier I want you to know tonight you are God's soldier. And when you signed up to serve God, you knew it wasn't going to be easy. You knew it wasn't going to be a bed of roses. You knew well, there were going to be times you came to church and you came dry and you might just leave dry. But you knew when you signed up that the blood of Jesus was worthy of your service. You knew that everything he had already done for you, if he never did another thing, he was worthy to be served. But you were going to serve God anyway. We're in a patty cake playground kind of church age. If we're not singing high, if the church ain't rocking and reeling, that we can't serve God. Let me tell you tonight, I mean, the church is not an entertainment business. If you really love God, you're gonna serve him. No matter if it's high, if it's low, or somewhere in between, you're gonna serve God because of your commitment. It doesn't matter what anybody else says to you. They're gonna look at you strange. You look at somebody that's committed and that they've got their mind made up They've got that deer in the headlight look, as they say. You cannot persuade them any way to change their mind because they're going to do what they feel like they're supposed to do. You know that commitment, it is a bond of marriage. It's not just you and your bride. Come on now. It's you as a servant of God. You are the bride of Christ. And there is a commitment in the bond of matrimony between Christ and his bride it is the testimony commitment is the testimony of true saints what sets the saints of God true saints of God apart from everybody else commitment somebody told me one time they said that these fitness places make a killing at the beginning of the year off of people don't have any commitment. They want to get you locked into a year's plan. Anybody else done it? I haven't done it yet. Anybody else ever signed up for a plan and you went for a couple weeks and then you quit going? 
I want to tell you something. There's a lack of commitment is the reason why. And a lot of times we fall off the wagon and we think, man, I'm going to lose a lot of weight. But you don't stay committed to that. And the next thing you know, you're eating a big fat Reese bar. And the next thing you know, you're eating a big fat juicy hamburger. And you're thinking, man, I done messed up that diet. I mean, you got to stay committed to it if you're going to, if you're really going to accomplish anything. Do you know that even in the spiritual realm, if you're going to see God do anything, you got to stay committed to the task. You can't do it a little while and then get crying like a baby and quit. You got to, come on, you got to man up. You got to woman up and say, I know this ain't a good, this ain't an easy fight, but I'm going to stand up for the Lord. I'm going to get the sword of the Spirit and I'm going to get back in the Word of God. I'm going back to prayer and I'm going to become faithful in every way to the Lord. Can you say, God, help us tonight? I read this to you before, and I want you to listen to this. This probably, maybe some of you never heard this, but I like it. Because it gives me an idea or image into what commitment is. Anybody ever seen a B-52? Huh? It's a pretty good size airplane, ain't it right, Brother Benefield? To get a B-52 off the ground and having a big concrete runway usually takes about two miles of concrete runway to get a B-52 off the ground. B-52 sits at the very beginning of the runway, loaded down with tons of fuel. The pilot brings all eight engines up to maximum capacity. And then, despite the enormous roaring and all the racket and whining and hissing and the earthly noises that starts up, when they fire those engines up, the air, that airplane begins to roll forward ever so slowly as if it looked like it was beginning to roll down a slow incline. About that time, that B-52 has used up almost half the entire two-mile runway. And it's approaching what they call 90 knots. About that time, this pilot speaks up over the intercom and he says, coming up on 90 knots. Ready, ready, now, when he says now, timing. Then the next thing responds to the co-pilot. After some 13 seconds or so, the co-pilot speaks up again and says, coming up on 13.1 seconds. Ready, ready, now. And about that time, the pilot looks at the airspeed indicator and sees the airspeed is at or exceeding the S1 speed, approximately 100 miles per hour. And then he announces committed. What that means is you've come to a point that you can't go back. You either got to fly or there's no turning back. You understand? Amen. They've gone so far. There's only one other thing to do and get that airplane off the ground and up in the air. And I tell you tonight that there you and I would have to agree that for the child of God to get past the altar, to get past our excuses uh, and to get past the point of salvation there's got to be some kind of commitment if we're ever going to get off the runway do you know the reason tonight that a lot of folks ain't in this race do you know the reason tonight that a lot of folks ain't still in the fight it's because they never had a point of commitment can you say, God help us tonight? It's a sad day that we're living in that people don't have a true point of commitment. It's no doubt in any reason why that you and I can see that so many have fell out of the race with God. I want you to know that the writer of Hebrews is undoubtedly tonight dealing with specific details of the Christian life more. And he may be able to deal with certain specific things, but more than that, he's dealing with the whole of the child of God's life. He said, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And listen to this, let us hold Hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. When I read that and I think about wavering, anybody ever got behind a drunk driver? Or somebody trying to text a book? I don't know what in the world they're doing. You ever got behind somebody swerving all over the road? It can be a scary thing because you're thinking to yourself any minute now, 
he's going to hit somebody or he's going to run off the road and kill himself, right? You ever seen somebody just swerve all over the road? I've watched people before just weaving in and out, swerving all over the road, drunk, high as a kite. I've even called the police department before and told them, I said, you better get over here and get this guy off the road before he kills himself or somebody else because he was wavering around on the road. And so when I think about the Bible saying not wavering, I think about a drunk man who can't keep it between the lines. Do you know as a child of God, there's a balance of living right and living holy. I don't believe you got to live like some kind of troll up under a bridge somewhere and you can't have fun you can't never smile come on I believe if you got joy with your holiness and I believe if you can have a smile and still live right you keep that thing right between the lines and point it towards heaven's shore that's what God would have us to do tonight it is not the will of God for you and I to waver to the left or to the right but we're to keep on this straight and narrow path for the Bible said straight is the gate and narrow is the way and few there be that find it. My God, I don't know why people keep making it sound like that we're gonna have a mass exodus whenever the Lord returns for the church. There's gonna be a lot of folks that are left behind because they are not truly committed. I want you to imagine just for about two or three minutes here, the rapture was fixing to take place in this, during this service, which is possible. But imagine with me for just a few minutes that the rapture was about to take place and the Lord was coming for the church. And it happened. And you looked. And you were still here. You can say whatever you want to and you can get mad at the preacher and you can get upset and think everybody's being uh, ex highly expect expecting or whatever and thinking, well, you need to do this and do that and you think that's too much to live by. Whenever the Lord said that whatever he asked you to do is your reasonable service, but whenever you're still sitting in a pew or still sitting on a park bench or still sitting there about to take a bit by to your Big Mac and the rapture takes place and you're still sitting there you look back and remember this service and you can remember this preacher amen up here sick preaching with a cold amen I'd rather be at home in the bed right about now amen in my flesh but in my spirit I'm thankful for the opportunity to share with you one more time if this was my last chance to tell you you better get committed you better stop playing games and playing amen and giving God a thousand different reasons why that you can't serve God well God I can't because of this I won't because of that get under the blood and sell out tonight before this is your last chance. Say amen somebody. Amen. This is something that the Holy Ghost gave me some time back and you can write it down for what it's worth. Commitment is what keeps us and grace is what sustains us. Why am I still here right now? Pastor Myers, why are you still here? Commitment is what keeps us. Grace is what sustains us. You might have to continue on hobbling, dragging one foot. Your commitment will take you to places you didn't think you could go. God's grace will keep you through it. Somebody was telling me here a while back, said it would blow a person's mind if they realize what the human body can go through and still survive. Not everybody makes it. But it, it just blows my mind that they can take a human being, stop a man's heart, and get his heart going again within a few minutes. And he still lives. It blows my mind that a man can lose so much blood and the next thing you know, that man's still alive. That a man can lose all of his limbs, arms and legs and somehow with the help of God and the assistance of doctors, that man still lives. And I tell you that in the spiritual, it'll blow some of your mind if you knew amen, what you could survive. You say, God, I can't make it through this. God, I can't deal with this. I, I don't know how in the world I'm going to 
survive it. Do you know that if you got enough commitment to take you there, God's got enough grace to survive, help you to survive while you're there. God, I feel the Holy Ghost. Man, if you got enough commitment to keep fighting on, God's got enough grace to keep you while you're in the fight. Say amen, somebody. It would do you and I good to ask ourselves just how committed we really are because commitment is generally revealed under the greatest pressure. You want to know how committed a marriage is? Don't go talk to the bride and the groom on the wedding day. Huh? Don't go talk to them a week or two after. Talk to them whenever they ain't got a dime in the bank. One's mad at the other because they think the other one might have spent the last $5 because they had to stop by 7-Eleven and get a big gulp and a smoky big bite. And that was the last $5. And now they don't know how in the world so-and-so's going to get to work now. And blah, 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 blah. We ain't got enough money for this and that and the other. And now they're pointing fingers at each other. Nobody knows what. Come on now. You understand what I'm saying? You want to know, know how committed a marriage is. Go to them when they're, they're, they're under the most pressure. When one of them's down fighting a battle of discouragement and depression and the other one's angry because of everything that's going on in their life and it's like putting two wet cats tied to a, amen, to a clothesline by their tail right beside each other. And you're like thinking to yourself, are they going to make it through this? If you're committed, you're going to make it through it. You might, come on, you might claw each other's eyes out, but you're going to make it through it because the commitment's going to keep you through it. Do you know that as a child of God, there's sometimes uh, that you're going to go through some junk Amen. That you may feel like that you're going to cry, go call your own eyes out. You're going to feel like you ain't going to make it. But, honey, if you're committed, you're going to pull through it and you're going to be just fine. Stop letting the devil beat you down, make you think you can't make it. Say amen, somebody. But under the greatest pressure is when real commitment is revealed. Because it's easy to be committed when things are good. You hear that? When all is well, but you find out how committed somebody is when things ain't so good. Somebody told me one time, I read part of the story about it, about a young woman. She was, uh, I think it was a car fire or some type of fire and she was involved in and she was a very beautiful lady. This car fire, whatever this fire, caused her body to be so severely burned that her face looked like it was once wax and the wax melted. Her face was so contorted. And the story went on to tell how that sometime after, the guy that she had married left her. Because he said she wasn't the woman she used to be. I told my boys, told my daughter the same thing. I said, son, I don't care if your wife, something happens to her and she ain't got but one leg, two legs. Come on now. (laughs) I don't care if she gets a disease and she gets as big as a house. I said, I don't care what happens. I said, you either committed or you ain't committed. Didn't I tell you that? You either love her or you don't love her. If you love her, it doesn't matter. If she gets caught in a house fire and her face don't look the same, I said, boy, what's on the inside of that woman will always be the same. You ain't never going to change that. Let me tell you something. It's under the greatest pressure, you hear me, that you find out how committed somebody is. You want to know when a church is hopping and jumping and skipping and running and it seemed like that we're about to break attendance records and all of that that. Amen. Don't look at a church during times like that as to whether the church is strong. You wait till the church goes through a storm. You wait till they go through some kind of controversy or some kind of mess. And then you watch and see whether they stay in the fight. You watch and see whether or not they stick it out. And then you'll find out just how committed that they are. Honey, I want to tell you, I've been through some junk myself. And I've had people tell me before, said, Brother Myers, the one thing that I appreciate about you We've watched you go through so much junk, but you stayed and you didn't run. You didn't quit. You didn't give up. You just kept right along. Honey, I don't know what else to do. This is what God called me to do. And as long as God's grace will sustain me, I plan to do what God tells me to do. Can you say amen? I 
believe every child of God better, better find out how to get better equipped and better committed to the Lord because trying times are on the way. Amen. For years, we've had the very easy privilege. We've had very little opposition. I know some folks may think that some of the things they faced was great opposition. But we've had very little opposition in America as opposed to what America could be facing here in the very near future. Telling you what you can and what you can't preach because it may offend this one or it may some other person may not like it. You understand. But I wonder if the church will stand. I heard one brother put it like this. This was several years ago. He said, I believe, Brother Myers, there's going to come a day when those that are serving God for the fishes and loaves ain't going to be here. It's just going to be left those that are there, not for the fishes and loaves, but because they love Him. Did you get a hold of that tonight? You're not here for the benefits. You're here because of Him. Say amen tonight. It's time for sinners to commit their lives to Christ. Backsliders to commit their lives to Christ. It's time for saints to renew their vows of commitment to Christ. I wonder tonight if you could ask yourself a question and really think about it. Is my walk with the Lord really unwavering? I want you to think about that tonight. Is my walk with God really unwavering? When my faith is tried, do I sink real fast like a rock to the bottom of the lake? Or do I just bounce up and down a little bit and then regain my strength? When my commitment is tried and I go through trials... And the devil gets on my shoulder and says, yeah, if God really loved you. Do you sink right to the bottom and give in under the pressure? Stop feeling, start feeling like, oh, God hates me and all this stuff. Or do you hold fast and say, no, God loves me and God's going to keep me through this. What kind of commitment have you got tonight? Is it the temporary kind of commitment? That says, well, I'll, I'll be faithful to God as long as it don't interfere with my plans. Huh? Let me tell you what disgusts me. Y'all listening? Y'all about to find out something about my personal opinion. You ready? You want to know what disgusts me? Is people that like to put on a show. Amen. That disgusts me. I look at it like this. I remember years ago, I'm going to close here in just a minute. I remember years ago, my wife and I, we were youth pastors. And uh, I ain't going to go into great detail. We'll just try to hit the high points here. But we had some young folks that we were youth pastoring. And uh, it seemed like when we would have certain evangelists come through, if they were real conservative during the revival, you'd watch them start changing things and doing things different during revival. Because so-and-so believes this way and this one believes that way. Amen. If you're just going to change like a chameleon on a leaf, either be who you are. Don't change because some evangelists come through. If you can't live that way all the time, don't just change things up because some certain person comes by. Amen, somebody. Either be who you are and be proud to be who you are. If you've got to be ashamed, you better check up and find out whether or not you might have compromised. Amen. Otherwise, hold your head up high and continue the fight. But don't hypocrite on God and don't put on a big show. I've watched people that are as dead as a hammer. And they don't get in to save their life. They sit there, clip their fingernails, going back and forth to the bathroom, read books while I'm up preaching. And you get some evangelists come through, amen, with three points and a close, and they act like the world's about to blow apart. They'll take off running, high, whoo, hallelujah, rolling the floor and everything else. And I think, where have you been for the last three years? Huh? As soon as revival's over with, it's like somebody put a pen in their big balloon. <laughs> Back to the same old me. You know what disgusts me? People that fake it. You either be who you are, you either got it, 
or you ain't got it. I tell you tonight, I'd rather I have so much more respect for somebody that if the Holy Ghost gets on them and they shout under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, thank God. But if the Holy Ghost ain't in it and you ain't shouting, it don't bother me. I'd rather you be true to yourself and true to God. Can you say amen? I feel the Holy Ghost. Stand to your feet tonight. I'm just telling you tonight, you and I have got to get back to commitment and there's a few things I want you to understand that you got to be committed to. First of all, prayer, practicing what we preach and the pursuit of depth. How deep are we as a child of God? Sister, why don't you come play a piano or something, anything, just anything. I love Jesus or whatever. We're going to get back to being committed to prayer because it's through prayer that you and I obtain power with God. Amen. Imagine, imagine if you're getting by with very little prayer, imagine what you could do if you had a lot of prayer in your life, communicating with God. Imagine. I'm going to have to get back to the pursuit of depth. The only way you can pursue depth in God is to do it in the altar, do it in His Word, get deep in the knowledge of the Word of God. You want to be used? I, I asked everybody a few weeks ago, you want to be used of God. Do you know tonight? It's the desire of the Lord to make you a vessel that He can use. But you've got to put your hand to the plow. You've got to be the one to put your hand to the plow. And in due time, God will open the door. Recently, I talked to one young man. I talked to him about ministry and about what he could do in the Lord. One of the things I told him, I said, if you're really called to the ministry, I want you to understand it's brutal. I'm not going to lie to you. I said, if you ain't really called to ministry and you try to do ministry, I said, it'll kill you. I said, but if you called, you'll make it. I said, but let me tell you something. Before you even embark and start in ministry, there's one thing you've got to do. You're going to have to have some consistency in your life. You can't be up and down and in and out. I said, because that up and down, in and out, if you run into that battlefield and you're already inconsistent before you get on the battlefield, Brother Justin, whenever you went into the military, did they take you through boot camp? You know why? Because they want to condition you and get you ready for what you're going to face. Can you imagine if you just come right off the street, don't have a lick of training, they stick you out there? You probably get killed. Because one of the things they teach you in the military is how that you can depend on you on the folks that you're fighting with. That's those those people you are fighting with. If he don't do what he's supposed to do, he might get you and him both killed. So when they take you through boot camp, they they teach you attention to detail and how to lean on one another in the fight. I'm telling you tonight the same thing I told that young man. You're going to have to have some consistency in your life. You expect God to use you and to flow through you. I'm going to open up this altar this evening, and I'm going to let you come on up. If you want to run, crawl, I don't care what you do, but you need to find yourself a place tonight and begin to pray and ask God to help you to have the commitment that it's going to take when the rapture takes place to make heaven your home. The Bible said bring fruit, meat,